Unions are very important institutions to try and understand, certainly in terms of the employment relationship, where they're considered as one of the, the, the central actors uh, within, uh, within that relationship, uh, but also in terms of uh, rewards. Um, rewards represent the, the, the key concern uh, of uh, labour in in, within the employment relationship. They represent the key issue uh, that employees uh, are focused around. It's the key cause of, uh, of conflict. Um, and so the way in which unions um, are oriented around re rewards and pay is quite natural uh, and needs to be understood uh, in, order to, uh, to, uh, in order to place that uh, within, within context, to make sense of what it is that, uh, that, that unions uh, want how they operate uh, in relation to rewards and what their priorities are. So we need to spend a little bit of time just familiarising ourselves with these as organisations to understand what they are, where they come from, how they think and what they're influenced uh, by. And so we're going to begin that process uh, that, uh, here. Now, as we've mentioned um, earlier, uh, unions represent uh, the development of a, a long desire that we've seen historically for employees to attempt to shift the, the balance of advantage, the balance of power uh, within labour markets. Uh, and this usually takes on some kind of institutional form. Sometimes that balance of advantage is, uh, is moved because of regulation or legislation, like a, a minimum wage or a living wage or whatever we might want uh, to, to call it. Sometimes it happens because of market forces. Um, but sometimes it's simply about trying to um, increase your power within the bargaining relationship, to increase your power, your weight uh, within the labour market. Because individually as employees, unless you're spectacularly unique and valuable, uh, most of the time, you can't exercise much influence to move the labour market in your favour, um, simply because there are too many uh, employees in that situation, too many interactions, too many possibilities for buyers to go elsewhere. So unions represent one of those organisations, similar to, to guilds, that we've seen develop uh, within labour markets over the centuries uh, in order to exercise more power, more advantage on the seller's side of the labour market as against the buyer's side, side of the, of the labour market. So um, we can see them as part of that tradition. Now, of course, uh, the kinds of modern trade unions that we see now, some of which have uh, multi-millions strong in terms of membership, which operate across industries, across occupations, and with some beginnings of international joint ventures between unions in order to compete effectively in a, a global labour market. Um, to some extent, they're a very far cry from those early medieval guilds, but they do represent, as we've said earlier, uh, a similar kind of intention. So what can we know about unions? How can we make sense of the way in which they behave and how they operate uh, in a modern uh, context? So if we, if we take it back to kind of bare bones um, and we think about um, the way in which um, McElroy uh, talked about unions and what they're for and what they do, uh, he identifies a, a number of key features. Firstly, that unions came into being as a response to capitalism. So they are a symptom of our economic system. And we've talked about this implicitly uh, before now. Uh, that we've, we see that they, uh, they act in order to um, provide a, a different kind of balance that wouldn't otherwise be there in labour markets. So they're a symptom of that market situation that capitalism as an economic situation implies. So they, they, they're not just standalone things, they didn't just pop into existence, they came into being as a response to a set of economic conditions. So we need to ground our understanding of what they are and what they're for within those economic uh, conditions. 
Part of those fundamental economic conditions, as McElroy goes on to talk about, are that for the majority of people, all that we have that's of any value is our labour. And so in order to live, in order to survive, or have any reasonable standard of, uh, of living in a, in a, in a modern economy, um, the majority of people are compelled to sell their labour power. That is all that we have uh, that is of value. That's all that we have uh, to sell. And that as part of that process, as part of that dynamic of selling our labour power, there is a, an imbalance, that the market isn't perfect, that one side of the labour market has more power than uh, the other. And so unions exist in order to redress uh, that balance. And the way in which they redress that balance is to try to overcome the individual weakness of employees within the labour market with collective strength. So collectivism and the desire to replace individual bargaining between employees and their employers with a collective unit is absolutely central to the raison d'etre of trade unions. That unions have to have this collective orientation. Unionism implies collective bargaining where employees are grouped together into units and that collective strength, their ability to um, remove their labour, to strike, to disrupt the productive processes, all of these things represent um, a potential source of power for unions against what we already know as the uh, implicit strength of employers in the labour market. So collectivism and unions go hand in hand. So to understand the way that, that unions behave means that we need to appreciate that collectivism is at the very heart uh, of what they do. Now how that is expressed obviously changes depending on union, depending on personalities, depending on circumstances, depending on industry, organisation, values, ideology, economic circumstances, all kinds uh, of things. So what kinds of influences might we see which alter the ways in which uh, unions might behave uh, from time uh, to time? The first thing, uh, very clearly, is the economic context. We keep coming back to this. Product markets lie at the heart of virtually all of these uh, issues that we're concerned with. They're the, they're, they're the floor upon which everything else uh, rests, the base uh, that Marx uh, might have uh, uh, referred to it as. So the economic context in which unions operate has a major influence on how they might uh, behave. So what are the income trends uh, within uh, a particular labour market or within a particular uh, economy? Are people doing very well or are people suffering? Are living standards increasing or are they decreasing? Um, the answers to these questions will then start to indicate the kinds of orientations that unions might take towards that, uh, that economy or towards that labour market. Do they feel the need to be more militant or is the situation broadly okay and they can take a more moderate uh, line, that there isn't a huge problem to be solved? It's important to remember, unions are not revolutionary organisations. Unions are institutions which seek to reform situations, to move the balance of advantage in one way rather than another, not rip up the basis of the, of the economic uh, system. So they're, they're, they're very pragmatic. And so um, you will tend to see a greater degree of uh, industrial peace in certain economic situations than you will in others. Similar, um, similarly big and important contextual uh, issue is the socio-political context. Uh, what are the systems of labour regulation within which uh, an employment uh, um, relationship uh, operates? Uh, are there many rules? Are there many safeguards? Are there many mechanisms and institutions which, pr which already protect uh, the interests of uh, employees, or is regulation very light? The, the frameworks within which unions operate and the rules within which they negotiate uh, have a, a major influence on uh, the ways in which they will 
uh, seek to, to behave. So you will see um, across economies uh, in a developing nation, perhaps with um, autocratic government, with limited labour regulation and so on, that unions will take on a very different flavour of approach than they will in a very heavily regulated, established economy with systems of representation, sometimes systems of input into um, economic policy and so on, where they're in, implicit within the, the operation of the of the nation state and the workings of the economy, that they have a role. Unions will necessarily behave differently in one context uh, rather than another. So the power dynamics in society uh, have an impact upon how unions behave. The extent to which they are supported by the institutions of the state will have an impact uh, upon uh, unions. The extent to which um, the government of the day um, is broadly favourable or in opposition to unions will have an impact upon how unions behave. Their broad levels of popularity uh, within the population will have an impact upon how unions uh, behave. And so this is another important set of variables that we need to make sense of in order to, make, in order to properly understand the ways in which unions are behaving and how they might behave in other given situations. Two further levels of context that we might want to take into account. Firstly, the, uh, the employer context, the extent to which uh, employers are, um, employers' ideology is sympathetic to unions. This is similar to uh, the orientation of government to unions, but this time at the level of institutions, at uh, the level of the organisation itself. To what extent do employers um, feel uh, sympathetic towards unions, to what extent are they seen as partners or are they seen as outsiders? Uh, to what extent are they being set up as opposition uh, to, uh, to the, uh, the organisation and what management want uh, to achieve? Uh, and similarly, in, this, in, uh, in the way in which economic context broadly uh, provides a canvas on which union activity can be understood, the performance, the economic performance of an individual company will alter the behaviour uh, of, uh, of unions uh, and the interactions between unions and the organisation. So where an organisation is struggling more, we'll tend to see more, um, uh, more opposition, more, more defensiveness uh, on the part of management and often a response uh, on the part of uh, the union itself. The final level of context is the worker context. Uh, unions are um, at base an organisation of workers. Now, of course, they have bureaucracies and structures which create their own dynamics, but at base, they respond to uh, the level of uh, satisfaction or dissatisfaction amongst uh, the workforce. Now, they can't generate conflict where conflict doesn't uh, exist, or at least not successfully so for any period of, of time. And uh, it, there is little to suggest that that, that is a, a, a common feature of, uh, of union activity anyway. So the, the, at bottom, the basis of how unions behave will be to reflect and to express the level of dissatisfaction uh, within uh, the workforce. Now, we've seen these various influences uh, result in patterns of behaviour uh, across and between unions uh, over uh, long periods of time. Uh, over the past 30 years at least, uh, unions have been in a, a, a general period of, of decline, having grown very substantially throughout much of the 20th uh, century. Uh, in many uh, Western economies, particularly as uh, key manufacturing industries have offshored and, and, and moved uh, along with the tides of uh, global uh, economic uh, development, uh, many of the existing strongholds of union organisation have disappeared uh, from uh, the mature, um, developed uh, economies. And so many Western uh, trade unions have been in a period of crisis and have been attempted to renew themselves, to find new sources of support, new sources of membership, new sources of uh, legitimacy. And we've seen this take on uh, a variety of different forms. Um, but three broad approaches have tended to stand out. Uh, on the one hand, we've seen unions attempting to um, 
establish their legitimacy uh, by um, appealing to organisations to identify themselves as being important productivity partners uh, with organisations. That because unions have an inbuilt legitimacy with the workforce, which management often struggles to achieve themselves, um, that striking productivity agreements and other kinds of workplace reforms hand in hand with unions um, will have more effectiveness um, than it would uh, if management were to, to go it alone. And this uh, so-called partnership approach to unionism um, has been a, a feature of the, uh, the late 1990s and early uh, 2000s. Not always terribly successfully, either from the point of view of uh, the unions themselves, who uh, often didn't get the membership gains uh, that uh, they might have expected, nor indeed from uh, their members, uh, who didn't uh, often share in the benefits of partnership uh, arrangements. Uh, and these were often seen to be uh, best all round uh, for employers uh, rather than uh, anybody else uh, within the employment uh, relationship. Another approach to um, uh, unionism uh, that we've uh, seen uh, as a, 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 um, a, a common uh, approach towards uh, renewal over this period is so-called social movement uh, unionism. And this is about building out uh, from uh, the traditional basis of membership uh, in the union movement out from the workplaces into communities to uh, find uh, new sources of influence, new sources of activism, new sources of um, uh, of mobilisation uh, to fight campaigns around social justice uh, issues, to establish the le legitimacy as a social partner uh, within the community. The final approach uh, that we've seen uh, unions adopt uh, is almost the polar opposite to partnership unionism, and this is so-called organising unionism. And this is where unions attempt to find uh, their way back to their initial uh, source of support to build a new, vibrant, campaigning, workplace-based uh, identity where they fight on issues, organise from a basis of collective strength and take on, organ take on uh, uh, employers uh, in a more traditional, militant uh, way. Uh, now, again, this often requires unions to reorient their uh, their approaches to resource areas of activity that have often become moribund uh, and is very difficult uh, to achieve. Um, one thing that can be very clearly said, whatever these three forms of, or three um, broad strategies towards renewal, uh, is that um, whatever unions have attempted to do, um, without the right kind of, um, of, um, of contextual uh, uh, situations uh, being uh, present, it's unlikely that unions are, likely to, are, are going to see uh, a substantial growth uh, uh, in either membership or influence.